obviously. For, for those of you who don't uh, know very much some about me, sometime <laughs> shortly after we would launched the uh, so-called critical security studies thing, I had the opportunity for what I call in the paper deep participation. So I, I joined the tribe, I think uh, would be the, the right phrase, I, uh, of diplomats, activists, UN officials, practitioners, and others who are working on a particular uh, issue that I talk about in the paper. Um, and I like to think of it as a jungle, as an ecosystem. So we shared the same watering holes, we tramped around the same territory, and we did various things. And I do note in the paper that um, deep engagement in my case meant that more than half of my time was spent not being an academic. Um, I suppose, in full disclosure, my salary was paid <laughs> indirectly, at least, by various ministries of foreign affairs. <laughs> so I was uh, completely crossing uh, the fence uh, in this regard. And I've recently come out of that at the end of uh, 2015. I had not disappeared completely, but uh, I was somewhat less visible in academic terms. So I'm trying to make sense of this and, of course, uh, about whether or not we had a program of making change or actually did make any change. And this was, of course, a question that Rebecca posed in theoretical terms. Uh, I think it was how, how is it that uh, you can think about whether practice theory can be critical theory, can, can practice be critique, um, which is the reverse, I think, of the way Maria could put it, which was can critique be practice. So I don't know, but can, can practice be uh, critique? The paper has a bunch of illustrations and stories, and if I were among practitioners, I would tell stories <laughs> almost exclusively, and maybe after lunch that's what I should do. But I really highlight uh, three kind of moments or illustrations uh, here, uh, and I'm going to try and pull out a few of the, the, the lessons. The first uh, moment was what I call critique light, which is what you do when you enter into uh, diplomatic practice and how that operates. And, and I, I say in the paper that uh, really it's about learning by doing, and maybe it was for me, maybe other people knew this stuff, but um, in any case, the first goal of the exercise was not just to, to learn how to be a diplomat, um, and in my case I was on various national delegations and so on, but also how to reflexively analyze that and then disrupt and destabilize insofar as that's possible. Um, diplomatic uh, practice, and in particular, disrupt the subject positioning that external interlopers, whether they're civil society actors or NGOs or others, get placed in, or even the, the sub subordinate uh, position that so-called experts often get put in. So um, we tried various techniques and strategies, some of which I relate anecdotally uh, in the paper, but the, the main insight, and this was at the outset of the work we did at the Small Arms Survey was that we didn't think change was going to occur by publishing reports, by making policy recommendations, by giving briefings, or apologies to Christian, by organizing workshops. Um, we did do all of those things, but we didn't think that was the, the theory of change uh, behind it. And so the goal was uh, not to be an advisor or an expert in academic, but to be an actor or a player or, or a member. Um, and to get as far in as possible uh, for that. What was interesting to me about this, aside from how, in very micro level, daily basis, you could disrupt um, diplomatic practices, and, and there are a few examples. I encourage you to skim the paper while I speak, because the examples uh, are, in some cases, enlightening, and I'm happy to elaborate on them, but was the resistance that all of the researchers that we worked with had to participating in this way. They didn't get it. They didn't necessarily understand how to play this game. And many of them thought, as many of our colleagues do, that the goal of the research was to produce a written document that would somehow make change. Um, and so there was a socialization process on the researcher side to say, no, that's not actually how this is going to work. You have to build relationships of trust. You have to engage with these people very directly. Uh, you have to be one of them, uh, which is more than just speaking their language. But they have to recognize you. You have to hail and they to interpolate, and you have to be considered uh, part of this domain. Uh, and that was a socialization process that we had to do among the staff uh, in all of our cases in order for people to, to be part of that. And uh, the examples that I offer are usually about transgressing particular kinds of boundaries, violating certain kinds of rules and restrictions that were put on us um, or on everybody in, in civil society, uh, and uh, occasionally also trying to shift the hierarchy in various ways. But as I point out by about page nine in the paper, um, destabilizing diplomatic practices uh, is not in itself actually change making. It might be uh, a precondition to it, it might be some part of it, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, make change uh, in any way. So um, I've inserted a quote there that somebody asked me if it was real. 
um, on page nine. And yes, it is. I did not make. I could not make that up. Um, but I suppose we could always uh, claim that if the National Rifle Association thinks that you are a unique and dangerous organization and a formidable foe, then you probably are doing something right, um, and and possibly even uh, having the potential to to make change. So the second mode of critique here uh, is, I think. Oh, in reflective terms, I would say uh, maybe a caveat that a precondition for any kind of critical practice was that there was a, uh, an epistemic uncertainty, a great deal of opening, uh, not just a predefined problem to which solutions were needed, but rather the problem itself is ill-defined uh, and is somewhat open. And I, I think that's a constraint um, or a condition that is not met by a lot of the sites in which we might want to engage. And if the problem is predefined, uh, then problem solving is all that's being asked for, and it's very hard to do uh, critique. But we had the good fortune to be in a situation where the definition of the problem, in this case, what are the consequences of small arms and light weapons proliferation and misuse, was, was, was quite open. Uh, and I think that created opportunities that don't exist in lots of cases. I give a couple of illustrations in the paper. Um, <clears throat> one of them at the sort of macro diplomatic level. Uh, which was uh, uh, about the initial beliefs that most people had about what the nature of the problem was, which was essentially arms being sold from former Eastern European states and the Soviet Union by shady brokers through all sorts of transactions and ending up in conflict zones like Sierra Leone and Liberia and elsewhere. Um, and that was deployed in all sorts of speeches and documents and so on. And that turned out actually not to be true. Um, well, not to say that there wasn't arms being brokered, but the actual weapons that were being used in conflicts and collected after wars when we got a chance to do some inventories and figure out what they were, were weapons that had been sold 20 or 30 years previously and had been circulating and recirculating. And the real source of the problem was actually you know, so-called stockpile security or diversion or corruption or other things among southern states themselves. And this was at least a highlighting of where the locus of attention ought to be, and it was not one that made everybody comfortable, including a lot of southern states that were quite happy to claim that the problem was only about, you know, bad northern arms brokers and so forth. Um, this also worked on the micro level. There's an anecdote, or it's not an anecdote, it's, it's a, a story that uh, is not in the paper, which is uh, we also did something which we could have thought of as forensic fingerprinting of ammunition stockpiles among uh, uh, pastoralists and armed groups in northern Kenya and Uganda. This is one illustration among many. And when you do these fingerprints, you find out that the kinds of ammunition that they have, where it's from and how old it is and so on, which you can easily identify by looking at head stamps of, of uh, ammunition, um, corresponded on both sides of the border. So whether it was informal armed actors or the uh, Karamajong in northern Kenya or the Kenyan National Police, they all seem to have similar kinds of distribution of ammunition. So the idea here was to go to the district police commissioner, private briefing, and say, you know, the, the, the ammunition that you're supplying to your police is ending up on the other side of the border, and it's uh, creating all sorts of accelerating violent exchanges and, uh, among cross-border pastoralist communities, and this is obviously a problem. Um, and they said, uh, yeah, actually, well, we, we gave it to our pastoralists because we thought they needed to defend themselves because we couldn't protect them, and we thought this was a good thing, and upon reflection, actually, maybe it's not such a good thing because um, uh, it does have consequences. But there, so there was an openness, in, and there are many other examples like that, to being able to to make change on a micro level in the kinds of practices I do think, you know, maybe didn't save a lot of human lives, but they might have had some positive effects. Um, the third mode of critique that I talk about in the paper is actually stepping outside of the initial frame entirely and to try and change that. So instead of taking the small arms problem and saying, well, we can reframe it as this and that, so actually say it's not about the guns. Kind of sounds like what the IRA, NRA would say, which is also partly true. Um, but for all of us engaged in this, it was actually about the violence, right? And about the way in which uh, artifacts are used in violent exchanges to uh, increase uh, power and, and kill and maim humans. So the idea here, um, and this was a much longer story that I only tell very telegraphically in the paper, was to see to what extent, and here it's we, not me, not small arms survey, but a whole bunch of people, we could actually uh, change the way in which the international community approached issues of armed violence. Um, and I will say with as much modesty as I can that there was some success in this, again, by a lot of people, because early on we said the Millennium Goals uh, did not include anything on peace and security. 
Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the development community was totally resistant to talking about security and development for reasons that many of us know about. And they certainly didn't want to engage in things like violence prevention and reduction. So how do you move that? Well, the end of the story is that by 2015, you do get Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is about peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, the first target of which is reducing all forms of violence everywhere. Um, and that was a huge change from the situation in about 2005, uh, when most international engagement with issues of violence was conflict-related, um, and only conflict-related. Uh, and we, in some of our work, and a lot of other people, again, involved in this, wanted to say, you know what? some of the most violent places on the planet, um, including, I'm afraid, Brazil and others, are actually not, in, not war zones. And if you actually sit down and use the data and look at this, you can see that uh, most violence occurs in non-conflict settings. Some of the most violent places are not war zones. Uh, some of the pathways and etiologies of violence resemble each other across war and non-war contexts. And from a programmatic point of view, you need to start to think about what kind of tools and mechanisms and processes can be used to address that in all sorts of contexts. This is kind of completely commonplace now to the people who come out of Brazil and Central America and so on. It was very not commonplace uh, in about 2010. Um, so it can be done. <laughs> there are some really key uh, constraints on that. In the paper, I go through a few of the ways in which this was done, and I can't say these were all adopted consciously by any of the actors involved, but things like rhetorical entrapment, uh, specific target setting, uh, framing things in non-traditional diplomatic terms, and so on, which I think were, were part of you know, practicing uh, critique. The last couple of pages in the paper, um, I step back and I, you know, I've heard a, a lot of the criticisms that that Ben echoed and that Mike hears from people in the political science department and that I'd heard even before I left York a very long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, which was, oh, you've just been co-opted by, you know, the global military system or, oh, human security has been a state-led initiative and isn't really changing anything. I think there is merit to, to some of those things. Um, but if that's where you stop, um, then we may as well close the project uh, of post-critical uh, practice, if you will, because I think that they, they, they might be constraints or their uh, limitations or their things you have to recognize, but they don't actually prevent one from engaging in a particularly deep way if that's your own personal predilection in trying to make change, which I'd like to think we did a little bit of anyway. That's it.